Welcome to the theater of magic. Seven o'clock. It's magic. Eight o'clock. Hocus Pocus. Nine o'clock. Pat magic. Ten o'clock. Vanquish the chain. Eleven o'clock. You must break through. Midnight Madness. Tiger Saw. <laughs> Mystifying. Unbelievable. Spectacular. The theater awaits. Welcome to the Theatre of Magic guys, my name is Greg, how are you going today? How's your week been? Another hectic week for me, it doesn't look like they are it's slowing up at all, <laughs> actually. So it's been super, super busy for me, but um, today I thought, you know what, we're going to do something a little bit different, and something that I wanted to do right from the start, and I hope you guys will actually really enjoy this, because this is all about the history. This is about uh, understanding and taking you back to the sorts of feelings and thoughts that I had way back when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old and gaming was just starting. And the only thing we had back then, guys, was you know, no internet. And we were just starting into the world of online communications with some very slow modems. And so the only way that we could get information was through magazines. And for those of you that uh, enjoyed that era of the early 80s will know that there was, you know, there was a select few magazines that really came onto the scene that covered electronic video games for the first time. And to this day, I still believe there is one firm winner, the best video game magazine of all time. <laughs> what an entrance, right? And that was Electronic Games Magazine. And uh, this guy, and this is from some later versions. Now I've actually got pretty much nearly the full, full stack of them here. And what we're going to do in this series is we're going to go back in time and we're going to explore these. And I'm not going to do it, guys, like I see a lot of YouTube videos and they go back and they go through magazines or they go through, you know, old photos or whatever. And they do a very sort of historian type of coverage of, you know, what happened back in the day and who did what when and, um, you know, timelines and all that sort of stuff. That's not what we're going to do, okay? What we're going to do is that we're going to share what was special about what was going on back then in video games through the lens of the Electronic Games magazine. So, guys, I really do hope that you uh, that you enjoy this. This is something to, to sit back, you know, sit back, relax, have a drink, and uh, just contemplate how it was back in the day, you know, back before the internet, back before the rush and the, you know, just, I mean, even just thinking this week has just gone so fast and we're surrounded in information and computers and, you know, with our mobile phones and devices and, you know, we've got games on our phones as well as lots of information and different applications and it's just constant go, go, go. But, you know, back then, you know, way back in the 80s, it was a much, much simpler time. And when ele electronics came along, it was, you know, it was really a wonderful thing. It was, it was brand new and an exciting time to explore the world of video games. So let's get into the very first episode of Electronic Games magazine. And that is issue one and it actually wasn't called issue one and I've got on the iPad here because it's one of the ones that I don't have the first issue um, and it was just simply called winter <laughs> it doesn't have the year on it you know that was the the, the very first uh, magazine that really covered electronic games to any degree and I I'm pretty sure guys I remember actually buying this first issue but, you know, along the way it got lost, um, which is a real shame. But, uh, you know, every month, you know, after this was a, a couple of quarterly ones, I think, or a couple of bi-monthly ones initially, and then they went to monthly as it really started to take hold. But that was, for me, the main 
excitement day of the month was knowing that when that magazine came out, I'd be down the news agent, riding down there on my BMX bike, and I'd pick up that magazine and I'd take it home and sit down, lie on the bed, and I'd just pour over every page and I'd read every advert and I'd just marvel about what was going on. Of course, I was in New Zealand as well, guys, remember? So a lot of the, all this coverage was you know, predominantly of what's happening in the United States. And it was also very, very exciting. So, so let's get into let's get into the series. We're going to go through these mags, so we're going to just point out some things that were pretty cool. And the first thing here, on right from the outset, is this whole story on the front page here: Can asteroids conquer space invaders? So that's what it was all about. You know, these very early games and space invaders, asteroids, Pac-Man, Centipede. You know, they were the, some of the earliest ones. And right at this very start, was was when you know, you know, Space Invaders was starting to wane a little bit, and new new games like Asteroids came onto the scene. Attack of the Chess Robots. <laughs> That's interesting. Inside the TRS-80 color computer, we used to call that the Trash 80. That was the, the name of that, that computer. Um, the black. A friend had a black and white one, and I remember going over to his place to play it, and it was really. Well, I, I just didn't like it. I had a, I had the Atari VCS, which was pretty basic. Um, you know, 2600. Uh, but yeah, the old tra Trash 80, uh, it was a black and white, this one says about the colour, but I had the black and they, my mate had the black and white one, it wasn't good. Strategy Sessions, Space Invaders and Breakout. <laughs> Strategy on Space Invaders and Breakout, unbelievable. And then Touchdown, of course, part of American uh, football. So yeah flicking over into this magazine and it was funny you know atari had this real this ongoing campaign because they licensed every single main arcade game name um so they had space invaders they had missile command you know warlords asteroids as part of this advert here and they always used to you know talk that up they they're the ones that have got all the licenses now here's something guys i've really wanted to say for a long time and for some reason on the internet I still f can't find anyone really pointing it out. You know, even on YouTube videos, when people cover the Atari 2600 or the VCS Space Invaders, no one says the obvious. No one addresses the elephant in the room. And that is that Atari licensed the name. Every other game that they license, it's pretty, you know, they tried to get as close as they could. And we're talking about the VCS to 2600 graphics, guys. It's not, it's pretty hard to get anywhere near the sort of arcade quality graphics. That That's a given. But at least they tried, you know, with everything. But with Space Invaders, why did they make the characters completely different? You know, completely different. And I'm pretty sure later on there was someone who, who coded one um, that had, you know, pretty much, you know, the same sort of graphics as as the arcade now clearly the resolutions was a lot lower but they should have been able to do it and, and as i said i'm pretty sure there's one that's got one that you know looks like the arcade and i always thought that was strange you know when i first got my vcs i started with the atari vcs and you know i was so excited to play space invaders because as you probably know if you watch my other videos space invaders was my key game that was the one that i grew up with and really really got me into the whole gaming scene and I was really disappointed. <laughs> I was so disappointed. It just didn't look the same. It was the same, you know, some more sort of gameplay. The sounds are really odd. It makes a strange sound when the ship explodes. It's just like, I was just, oh, I was just so, you know, frustrated with that because like asteroids and that, they had colored asteroids instead of the vector ones. It was sort of quite cool actually having the color ones given the fact that the one in the arcade was vector um, of course vector is awesome but um, but that almost seemed like a bit of a step up you know on the vcs so so anyway guys a little bit of insight in terms of uh you know my first thoughts on the vcs games but yeah they atari had it sewn up and look at this this is the i mentioned this really really early on one of my uh, on the atari shelf video way 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 back right at the start of all the episodes and i talked about this color color set box set of all these games and i've been wanting to collect them all now i have to drag out my collection and see how far i've got on this list i want to actually get all of these <laughs> because again this was something that as i flick through this magazine guys i was like oh imagine having all those games i mean yes you know today we just you know we just download game after game after game you just got hundreds of games and you know back then it was like every single game you had to go out and you had to buy 
and they were rare you know they were they were compared to today you know they were relatively rare in terms of you know initially it was a big flood of games later of course but it was just such a special event so I, I really did sort of dream about having that full <laughs> full list of games or that full colour set of games. So we're going to have to do that one day, guys. And this from um, Epix. I always call it Ep Epix. I guess that's the way you pronounce it. I, <laughs> after all these years, that's the way I pronounce it. And they created this game called Crush, Crumble and Chomp. And this used to run on my Atari 800. And I had to put the basic cartridge in. So it, was a, it ran on basic. Um, and for some reason, I, I used to really love it. And I have played it, like, recently. I've stuck it on the, um, on my, my Atari 800 now. And it's, it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. It's so funny, isn't it? Like, you have these memories of, of certain games and you know you've played them to death. And, you know, you just... It, I, I liken it very much like reading, reading a book. And, you know, and watching a movie, for those of you that, you know, and I'm not a big book reader, right? But I get the whole concept that people say about, you know, reading a book and getting so immersed in it and it being better than the movie because your imagination takes over. Your imagination takes those words and turn them into whatever you want it to be. And, of course, that could be something really, really incredible. And that's what I used to do, you know, when, when you read through these magazines and you saw the artwork and stuff for some of these games and you just... You know, your, your mind went crazy about what it, you know what that game was like, and then when you played it, even though it was very simple graphics, I think your your mind tended to fill in all the blanks to make it, you know, more of an experience than 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 just what you saw on the screen. So it was, yeah, a completely different time. Then we come into the first part of the magazine called Switch On. And a bit of an introduction from Bruce, no less. And uh, he covers a few things. And, of course, this was the, the, the very first episode. Um, and look at this. He says, did you know that you're a member of the world's fastest growing hobby group? It's true. <laughs> it's like, you know, totally new. First Pong machine made its debut only a decade ago. Uh, today, more than 5 million Americans regularly play electronic games. Only 5 million. That's <laughs> the handful, really, isn't it, compared to today. So nearly 4 million homes now have programmable video game systems. This year alone, Americans will buy 2 million video game systems and 20 million cartridges. Now, I guess that's starting to get up there, right? But it still pales into comparison. You know, you think about Apple and their app store and how many billions of apps they've, you know, downloaded uh, over the last year or so. And, but I thought this was interesting. It's an interesting quote here. Gamers pour 10 million quarters into asteroids, coin-operated machines, every single day. Wow. 10 million quarters into asteroids on a daily basis back then. That, that is impressive. And then they went on to say that now it's reaching another milestone. Now there's a high-quality newsstand publication. <laughs> Uh, prompted by your overwhelming support uh, of the Arcade Alley in Column and Video. So there used to be, old, there used to be a video, uh, a, a magazine called Video, which I think covered like, you know, the old v VHS type um, video stuff. And they had a column in there covering video games. And of course, it got really, really popular. And that's what made them spawn out into electronic games. And sorry, I wasn't going to get into the whole <laughs> history thing in terms of, you know, some of the sequences of events, but that that I think is actually pretty pretty interesting about the start of this particular uh, uh, magazine. And funnily enough, peppered in with these, uh, in the magazine, were these little electronic devices, bridge players, and <laughs> a little bridge electronic game of course, we're still sort of migrating off the electronic games, the, the smaller handheld stuff as we were getting into uh, our console games. So plenty of those, tons of text to read. <laughs> Can't just look these up on the internet. That's how you get information on it. I was never a bridge player. <laughs> that, was whole, that was to the older generation for sure. So then we get into the reader's reply and they called it reader's replay. And a lot of uh, messages here from game, you know, game houses and stuff. So they must have gone around and, you know, let people know that they were starting up a video game uh, magazine. And, you know, tons of people here, um, you know, excited that there is a magazine devoted to electronic games. <laughs> Isn't it funny? There's a major excitement about that. And yet today, 
you know, electronic games, it's just so, so, such a common term. Over the page, we're into Activision Tennis, and it wasn't a game that I ever bought on the Atari VCS, and of course Activision was a group of uh, Atari programs that split out and did their own thing. This used to interest me when I get over and look at the Intellivision. So Intellivision always had to have these um, adverts that compared the Atari 2600 to the Intellivision graphics. And of course the Intellivision graphics looked awesome. Now I do remember one particular time a friend came over and had an Intellivision. And we had, I tell you what, I had heaps of fun. The controller was really weird, really weird with the disc controller on it. But I remember thinking, wow, this thing is actually pretty cool. Now, the graphics look good, but I think I remember that the actual smoothness of the gameplay actually wasn't that great. And that was something that the Atari 2600 did. I mean, there was so many things that they did right. A, they licensed all the, all the original game names for the arcades, of course, <laughs> as we just went through before. So that gave them the edge in terms of marketing for those things. But the games on the 2600 or the VCS were, were super smooth. I mean, even though they were sort of graphically very limited, they were super smooth and, and, I, and the gameplay and it was challenging and fun and fast and you know. And I'm pretty sure with the Intellivision, it, w it wasn't quite the same sort of experience from that point of view, but definitely looked better. And when you're looking at these magazines and that's all you had to go for, because you couldn't go just call up a YouTube video and check out someone playing a game. <laughs> you had to just look at the pictures in the magazine and you know, based on those pictures, really did look very very good but I was never tempted guys I was never tempted over to the dark side of Intellivision I stayed on the Atari 2600 and uh, and just carried on with the collection of course and the Atari just had so many games so many many much more games than the Intellivision ever had. And this segment here called Inside Gaming we're talking to David Crane of uh, Activision. I think he was an ex Atari. I'm not going to go through the, I'm not going through all these articles again, guys, in details. I'm just trying to pick out some of the things that um, that I know. But yeah, he developed this game called Freeway, getting the chicken across the road. It was very much a, like a Frogger type of uh, of clone. Um, but yeah, Activision did really, really well. Those guys that left Atari and started up, and of course they've they've carried on, right? have done extremely well. So I do have to say, again, not wanting to sort of go into the history of the of the magazine, but the editor and co-publisher is the co-founder of this magazine, and he, that was Frank Laneley Jr., he and Bill uh, Knuckle, is co-author of the original Arcade Alley, which was in that video uh, uh, game column. They're the, one, they're the guys that started it up. They're the editors. Uh, they, th those guys I have to thank um, sincerely for such an amazing <clears throat> magazine, which clearly even to this day holds up. And, you know, and, and seriously, guys, if you want to go back and actually understand what happened during the 80s, this is the magazine to get. It, it's, it's written well. Heaps of colour, uh, pictures, screenshots. It's just absolutely awesome. And how's this? This is amazing. This is one of the first little references to an Easter egg in a game. <laughs> so Atari confirms rumour secret messages, uh, messages exist. So this was in the adventure game. And uh, if you did a certain type of action, then you've re revealed the name of one of the programmers, I believe. And, um, yes, yeah, Steve Wright said an idea for the future. He said, from now on, he told EG an exclusive interview, we're going to plant little Easter eggs like, uh, like that in the games. Eventually, we may have a real treasure hunt with the clues hidden in various games cartridges. So that, that could very well be the start of the original Easter egg and Atari's adventure way back in the day. Moving over to the side, they talked about Atari's Red Baron, which I believe is a vector game and not one that I've seen personally, not one that I used to play. Interestingly, that cabinet they're showing there, very much like the style of the pole position cabinets they use later. So that's interesting. I never noticed that before. Um, I've seen Red Barons before, but it tends to be just the stand-up. So that's pretty interesting that they had that sort of uh, wraparound cockpit that they use for uh, pole position. And then, of course, a reference there to Atari's Warlords. And, you know, I, again, if you follow this channel, you know 
that there is a grail game in cocktail format format for players playing around Warlords. But of course, I'm going to try and recreate that experience to a degree on the Hankin. I'm going to give that a go. Moving over, there was some, looked like some sort of gaming event. What does it say here? Reportedly, high power players who missed out on last year's hugely successful Space Invaders tournament are coming out of the woodwork to get a piece of this year's action. So there, there was Space Invaders tournaments. Wow. Said, uh, everyone knows this is for Brett Strikes Out and Electronic Baseball. Everyone knows the National League won its 10th straight. Yeah, so guys, there was all the leagues going on back then, right? But of course, it was personal. Um, you know, physical, you had to be there and physically in, in person to play these games at these types of events. Uh, crazy, crazy times. Stampede is a game that I've since played, but I never played it really back in the day. And um, it's sort of a, a cool little game on the 2600. We move over to uh, ice hockey. Um, and look down the bottom there, score 100,000 in laser blast and win a commission. Uh, well, down the bottom there, that is the laser blast badge that I have, and I've got the I've got that badge with the one million um, extra little badge that goes underneath it. And I remember taking that photo, and I did cover that when I did the Atari shelf, showed you that badge that I got, and uh, how incredible that that's uh, that's in there. And I and again, I have played it since, and it seems to be pretty hard actually. I need to get on a proper twenty six hundred joystick to see if I can actually get my skills back up. Up the top, we have reference to a RAM disk for the Atari 800, of course, my most favorite uh, computer. And of course, that computer came, um, you know, started with 16K of memory. 16K, my God. I don't think you could even open a Word document with nothing in it and save it, and it would be, you know, it's going to be more than 16K. That was the entire memory of the computer at, at an entry point went up to 48K, which was the one that I had. And here's an amazing RAM disk for 128K, which was huge back then, guys, absolutely huge. And um, I think they had to do some form of bank switching so they could only access, you know, up to 48K at a time because that's the way, you know, the limits of the machine and then they had to sort of bank switch so you switch from that 48K to the next bank of 48K within the 128K. It works something like that anyway. <laughs> and here's the, here is the advert for the original video uh, magazine. How about that? A magazine that talks about video and what's on TV. <laughs> Ah, oh, gosh, it does seem like a long, long time ago. Here covering some of those devices again, there was plenty of these electronic chess games and um, lots of these little watches. And I do have my own little Casio watch, which I'll have to share with you at some point. And I, I love that. I love that watch. I'll, I'll definitely save it for another video. Uh, but it was one that I en ended up having to rebuy because, yeah, it just got, you know, lost back in, back in the day. Those old um, LCD, um, you know, they became worthless after a while. So people just, you know, sort of chucked them out. And yet now they're actually really, really valuable. And how about this down the bottom here, the Saturn Space Invaders jacket. <laughs> how, how cool were you if you could cruise down the street with wearing that jacket? <laughs> Oh, that is so cool. That is so cool. I wonder if anyone still has one of those. That is just really, really cool. And then over the other side here, we've got more little handhelds. We've got the Pocket Simon. You know, that's, that was that Simon um, Simon Says. I think it was a Simon Says game, wasn't it? When you, it says, you know, you had to follow the colours of basically around it. Um, it was pretty popular. Another Space Invaders t-shirt and then a sort of a dis children's discovery toy thing. And of course, these things weren't that cheap, you know, earlier on. And funny enough, look, this tiny computer with 2K of memory, 2K, 2,000 characters, that's all it's stored. Wow, that's how things have changed. Check this out, Super Bingo, a <laughs> home bingo machine. Wow, head-to-head -head boxing, a little handheld again. And then we had a lot of these little, little um, you know, de desk-type um, arcade games um, that you could buy. So this was a little... It actually says Space Invaders on the box. That's interesting. It's called 
Alan Invaders? <laughs> Should it be Alan? Alien. Um, that's, no, that is Alien. Sorry, that's my eyes. <laughs> Alan Invaders. Wow. Okay, so Alien Invaders. But it says Space Invaders on the box. Interesting. And then we got, what, a horse race analyzer? <laughs> a little special device just for analyzing who wins and uh, working that out. And right in the middle there, guys, look at that electronic detective. Now, guess what? I've got one. I've still got one. Now, that was something, again, I had to rebuy. It was something I played a lot with my sisters back in the day. We should pull that out, shouldn't we? We should pull out some of these old uh, electronic games and, and have another look at them. And again, you know, it was such a basic little computer system and had a little um, LED, uh, you know, LED, LED display with just some basic numbers that, that progress you through the game. And it was really quite ingenious. And it had like cards and stuff, you know, that you work with it and you filled out sheets. It was a, um, you know, a whodunit type of, of, of game. And it, when you think about it, guys, it actually was really quite ingenious, you know, what they came up with given the limited amount of power that they had in these things. And then we had got Scrabble on the right. Look at that thing. <laughs> Look at that Lexor Scrabble. Unbelievable. And right down the bottom corner there, poking out. What is that? Well, that is one of the original Apples, right? That's the original Apple II, is it? The disk drives there. It's got a nice, funky wooden case around the disk drives. Amazing. So this was the announcement here about the Tandy uh, color computer. So this must have been where, that, uh, where, that, where it was first released in terms of this time frame when this magazine came out. And as I said, the original, the original black and white one was terrible. This looks a little bit better. <laughs> and into the Q&A, and you've got to laugh, guys. You've got to laugh at some of these questions. Look at this question. Do video games damage television sets? Now, now actually, the funny thing is, is that that's not a silly question because, of course, the CRTs, um, will we get burning if you leave, you know, a game on as you, as we know with the arcade monitors, right? So, you know, they did actually cover cover that in there, and of course, a lot of the uh, arcade machines and the VCS used to do this as well. They used to color cycle, so if you left them just sitting there, they'd built into the machine to color cycle the whole screen so that you wouldn't get burn-ins. There's a question here about Atari Star Raiders, and I'll tell you what, Star Raiders, guys, was one of the first games I got for my Atari 800, and I was absolutely blown away with the 3D space graphics. Again, you've got to remember, you know, we only get sort of like 2D sort of stuff, and this was the first pseudo sort of 3D game I'd ever seen, and it just looked like the stars were just floating out of the TV, you know, set. It was really, really amazing. And... Yeah, there's a few stories there when I first got that machine, I'll probably say for another day um, in relation to that game. But it, it was just an incredible game. And there was a guy here asking a question about it and he was saying he, he loves it, but his favorite game. He'd enjoy it more though if he could figure out how to make my spaceship dock with a star base for refueling. Um, and it was tricky, <laughs> so it was a, an interesting game because, yeah, not only did it use the joystick, you had to use a multitude of keys on the keyboard, so it was just, you know, again, one of those just groundbreaking games early on that you just thought, wow, this is totally into new ground and um, a, a whole new era of complexity in terms of video games, and because you had a home, home computer, you had the ability to do that, you know, use the keyboards, not just like the arcade machine, so... It really started pushing pushing boundaries. And, it, and and how about this? Like I had problems every time I tried to load a game cassette into my computer. So I remember back uh, just before disk drives and you know when our cartridges were around, but a lot of the times people would buy the cheaper like tapes, like cassette tapes and feed them into their tape recorders and you'd sit there and wait for them to load and it just take forever and you, you get these errors halfway through and you have to um <laughs> you have to like forward it past the first bit of leader part of the tape and it was just so finicky <laughs> and, and then you're like waiting four or five you know six minutes or up to 10 minutes sometimes just to load you know some you know 16 to 32k program uh, of tape, just unbelievable what we had to do back back then. It is a funny, another funny question. Again, all of this is just so bizarre, isn't it, guys? I mean, you look at these questions now and you just think, oh my god, um, 
I, this is, I thought all computer games on cassette were written in basic computer language, but the Atari 400 version of Space Invaders loads directly into the machine without the associated basic ROM cartridge. How is this possible? <laughs> How can you run games without basic? <laughs> Uh, wow, it was just a whole, whole era of just naivety. <laughs> and check this out, the quest for the rings. I mean, this is the sort of advert guys that I'd sit there, you know, lying back in my bed and I'd just be staring at this sort of thing and look at the artwork and just thinking, wow, what sort of game is this? This was for the Odyssey, <laughs> how basic the Odyssey was, of course. And um, but how cool was the Odyssey when it had all these like um, extra things? It's sort of like this map, and I haven't had an Odyssey guys before, so but you know, I have seen it since on YouTube, and that it looked like, like a pretty cool system given its early age. Um, and it had all those extra little pieces that, that worked with it, which was so so cool. Amazing that you know, had that whole game as like a sort of deep strategy game. <laughs> it's one of, one of those very, very early strategy games, but the graphics were so crude, but it was made up for with the story and all the supporting information. And there we go, the Odyssey, and it was the Odyssey 2, in fact, and there's a whole selection of all the games, but of course it just could never compete with the Atari. You know, Atari 2600 just had so many developers developing for it. And of course, right back then, that was the start of really understanding which consoles would be successful. It was all about the developers, right? Which ones they would develop for, and of course, later on, that ended up being the, the video game crash because there was just so much being developed. There was oversupply and not enough demand and a game clout. Uh, glut rather and you know the quality of the games were, were rubbish and that's what really ended up being the uh, video game crash in 1984. So here we have a whole strategy session on how to zap more space invaders <laughs> and I, I, I do remember guys looking through this and you know really studying this section because spaces was what it was all about back then and breakout was also actually one of my uh, favorite games and funnily enough of course with space invaders he the guy who designed it and i can't quote his name so i don't know it off my off the top of the head but he actually um uh based space invaders on the concept of breakout um you know he looked at that game and he thought he'd turn the bricks into the invaders and make them move um, and instead of a ball, he would actually, you know, if you'd, you would use your firing. So yeah, the, the games were very much related uh, back then. <laughs> Look at that cool artwork. Asteroids versus Space Invaders. <laughs> Just love the, uh, love the artwork. So a whole article here talking about Space Invaders and, uh, and Asteroids. And again, it's just some, you know, just some interesting history here. And what have we got in here about uh, Taito had installed over 100,000 Space Invader machines and raked in over $600 million. Wow. The Bank of Japan had tripled the production of the 100 yen pieces, which they used over there to uh, feed the machines. And the Japanese PTA had tried to banish Space Invaders on the theory that it ins inspired kids to play Hooky? <laughs> what? <laughs> Hooky? <laughs> hmm. Word of this incredible success story soon reached American shores. Midway, the Bally coin operated game division, bought the US rights to SI, and that was off it went, guys, into the US. And that's what, of course, we have in the theater of magic is a midway space invaders. You know, that right from that very, very start, and that's why. That's why it's so, so special. So the rest of the story here carries on talking about spaces and how asteroids are uh, sort of creeping into it. <laughs> and then uh, and then they talked about Galaxian, of course, souped up Space Invaders. And yes, Galaxian was that next game that just blew me away. And I think I have actually mentioned it uh, a couple of times before, but that background star field on Galaxian was just what I uh, just looked at that and just thought wow <laughs> these beautiful stars and it was just an extra dimension on the original space invaders uh format and then of course after asteroids there was deluxe asteroids and they're talking about that in the article so again this is all really really um earlier on in the piece and there's this advert down here for a gamer pack you get the all four t-shirts here with pac-man missile command and uh, space invaders 
and asteroids, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> that is just too, too cool. What next for electronic games? So we've got a bit of an insight here. We've got a bowling and stampede, ice hockey and boxing. So we've got a whole lot of VCS. Uh, original uh, Atari 2600 games that they were covering and uh, and yeah, yeah the graphics so 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 crude look at the pricing here on the advert here for the uh, Atari 800 so that was the Atari 100 I had so the Atari 400 as well so this was 759 US dollars and I guarantee that that would have been for the 16k version not the 48 and if you think about that you know that for in terms of Aussie dollars, which is sort of like today's exchange rate, you'd be over a thousand dollars. But you're talking back in the 1980, you know that that really would be up there in terms of price. I mean, I think in terms of inflation, um, someone could probably work it out for me. But it's probably you know it's good what three thousand or so. That's probably the equivalent. Um, we're about three times in terms of the equivalent value back then. So that, you know it was expensive. Maybe not that much, maybe two and a half, but it was still very expensive, right? And we have the player's guide to programmable video games by the uh, staff of Electronic Games. <laughs> and then they talk about the history of Pong. Again, guys, get a little check out this magazine just for the pure history. <laughs> You'll just get an education. If you've missed all this stuff, if you're old, if you're younger than me, sorry, um, then you might have missed all these early things if you're interested in it. Pick up Electronic Games magazine and you'll learn everything that there, there ever was. More, much better information in here than there is on Wikipedia, I think. Well, that might be overstretching it, but you know what I mean. It's a lot nicer to, to read anyway. We look at the arcade awards here. Who won best Pong variant? Went to Video Olympics from Atari. Oh my God, I don't think I've actually ever played that. That's that's on the original 2600. That'd be interesting, but it's just a Pong game. <laughs> best sports football game. Uh, professional, hang on, football, which is professional arcade. So I think it was the Atari football, wasn't it? That one. Best target game, ESC Battle, which was Atari. Um, and I, actually, that was one of the first games I got on the 2600. And I love that game. And it's so basic. <laughs> it's so basic. But I played that for so, so long. Best. Um, it's a space fighter game, is it, for the SF? I'm trying to figure that out now. Yeah, space fighter. Um, Cosmic Conflict on the Odyssey uh, 2, God knows. Best solitaire game, Golf on the Odyssey 2. Wouldn't know anything about that. Most innovative game was basketball on the Atari, and that would have been the 2600, and even the version on the 400-800 was awesome fun. I used to play that a lot with my friends. Game of the year was Superman. Now, that's a, that's a game I haven't really, really played. And, and then again, this is 1981. Um, best target war game was Armored Battle by Mattel. Uh, so that would have been on the Coleco Vision, I think. And best Pong variant, Volleyball on the Odyssey 2. Again, I wouldn't have done that. Best um, space shooter game, Space Battle on Mattel. Don't know anything about that. Uh, audio visual effect, effect, Fishing Derby. Well, that's interesting. I haven't played Fishing Derby before by Activision. I might check that out sometime. The skiing game by Activision was the best um, it says solitaire game. Hmm, it must be like solo game. If it's like feather light joystick control, superb graphics and whooshing sound effects combined to create a game so realistic that some players have suffered wooden burn on the electronic slopes. <laughs> See what I mean about the whole, you know, imagination. You read through the stuff and you just think of just amazing, amazing game. Best innovative game was Adventure by Atari. My God, that first fantasy game. Um, it was the first one that Atari released on their side. So, and then it says, note, arcade awards were also given for the best coin-op electronic games. Space Invaders won in 1980, and yes, Asteroids took the prize in 1981. Whew, a very, very early kickoff. And I was a picture of an Atari VCS. I would have been absolutely jealous looking at all those games at the back there. And there's Superman. So they were talking about Superman on the VCS then, by the looks of things. Um, I have to fire, I have to figure, fire that up and and uh, on the emulator guys and check that out. Missile Command was a favourite of mine, and the uh, version on the VCS was actually pretty good. It wasn't too bad. One on the Atari 400 uh, and 400 800 was uh, very very good.
they cover more of the games there, Space Invaders, Pong, Superman, Breakout, Missile Command. They talk about all of the games there in some detail. And then over to Activision and Tennis and Fishing Derby. There's Laser Blast again and Boxing. And down the bottom, Custom Control with Lee Stick. <laughs> Uh, so there was, this was the thing that was so much trying to innovate with joysticks and you know and, and and the funny thing was is that the only joystick that I really wanted was one that was like an arcade joystick you know I didn't didn't want all these fancy funky weird <laughs> type of joysticks like just give me an arcade type joystick and of course the difficulty with that is because you didn't have a panel to put it on but there were some that came out that were very much an arcade sort of shape on a on a base um, and I actually never got one at the time and I actually got really really used to the Atari 2600 or the VCS joysticks and ended up actually just really really loved playing with those here we have the Channel F well funnily enough the Channel F the Fairchild system you know such a, a um, unique uh, console back then I didn't really hear much about it at all I probably completely gloss over this at the time I've since seen it and you know when people are doing emulation stations and showing all the different systems and I can see that the channel F and now I remember looking it up like several years ago going what the hell is a channel F <laughs> so funnily enough you know here it is being covered and again very very basic software and it just didn't really take off over to the Odyssey 2 system covering off different games there with basketball, computer golf, quest for rings, a lot of basic sort of games. Then into the Mattel. So was it the Mattel? Uh, was, oh, Mattel was the Intellivision, so I was wrong. The ColecoVision was a separate console, right? <laughs> I've got to get those early consoles right. I was such an Atari fanboy. I wasn't paying too much attention to that. But I tell you what, that... Um, that Mattel, I had another mate who came over with that auto racing. I remember that auto racing and just thinking that was wicked. And later on, I got a game called, um, oh, what's it called? Um, Rally Speedway. Rally Speedway on the Atari 400 800 was very similar to that, but just had much, much better uh, graphics again because the 400 800 was much more powerful than the Intellivision. Um, but yeah, what an what a awesome, awesome game. Uh, professional arcade upgrades to a computer. Oh my goodness, what is this? Professional arcade system is a modular system. So again, so many sort of attempts to try and you know squeeze into the market with something unique and innovative. And here we have an article. Which which systems for you? And it looks at uh, the scoreboard chart and it's comparing the Atari VCS or 2600 against the Odyssey 2 against the television. The Activision? So I don't even, I don't even remember what that is. And then the Channel F, which we just, which we just covered. And you can see that the Atari VCS really, really comes in with excellent across most games. Uh, sports games, fair to, fair to good though. The television wins out there with excellent strategy games fair again the television wins out in that area um, and graphics good on the vcs and excellent on the intellivision and the activision um, so yeah as i said that 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 matches with with what i thought back in the day but you know the variety it's got the variety of games the arcade games got excellent on the atari vcs and that's what it was about guys you know you go out and you play the arcade games you want to come back and play the same games and and it was a marketing thing but you know if you bought the same same the game with the same name it was so much better than buying some you know astro invader that was supposed to be space invaders you know it was nothing better than getting the real the real thing and we've got a coverage here on the quest for the rings which looks like what was that was that for the odyssey uh, two again and then we get over to Missile Command and Kaboom Kaboom was a pretty popular game on the VCS then we're covering auto racing again we've got stuff on Missile Command um, Space Invaders auto racing SE Battles <laughs> the same old names coming up again and again earlier on in the piece um, gosh more on SC Battle through to Breakout Pong, so much info here guys if you're interested. Boxing, Alien Invaders, <laughs> Space Battle, 
video whiz ball and then we're getting into the back end of the magazine we're making fun of television electronic games <laughs> Uh, and of course you could mail it and get a, a subscription to your magazine and have it delivered to you. Computer Playland, well here we go, the whole section here, a whole article on that fantastic game that I was talking about in terms of Star Raiders, just absolutely awesome. You know the only thing that I didn't like about it was the fact that when you put your shields on, the screen would be green and would stay green just showing you your shields are on but it just made it didn't make the graphics look as very nice so often i'd like to take the shields off so that the you know the the uh the space scene was all nice and black and you could you know see all the stars coming on your nice crt tf tv and uh, it looked so much better but of course you get hit by a, a, a photon torpedo and you'd be destroyed but uh, yeah, that was definitely awesome. We move on to a bowling and a and of course very basic on the VCS. What else we got here? Sands of Mars, never heard of that. House of Usher, oh my goodness. Nominos Jigsaw, S Space Chase tends to ring a bell, but there was just so many space type, you know, games with space in it. War at Sea, don't remember that. Uh, Alien Rain, Asteroids Field, Look at this ad here, Mystery Funhouse. I think it's just a bit of a heartwork. Empire Over the Mind. Wow. That was for Apple II and the Atari 800. The, the pet, the pet Commodore and the, the Trash 80. <laughs> uh, no, nah, never played that either, actually, back, back in the day. Dino Wars they talk about. And then we get into what's new in the arcades. And this was... This was the area, guys, that I used to just absolutely crave to read, you know, the new arcade games. And the first thing, one up, is <laughs> how incredible is, is this, is talking about, um, and I'll, I'll say pla plates is how I, or pleads, 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 pleads. Um, and funny about that is that is the cocktail I just picked up recently. <laughs> So, now it doesn't look exactly like that in terms of the machine, but yep, that's the PCB that I've got sitting over here in the theatre. Yeah, what an amazing, amazing game that was as it was coming out over the back of, you know, Space Invaders, Asteroids and Missile Command and... Ah, uh, what else was released here? Space Odyssey... Uh, it's funny, it says Space Odyssey is capable of generating 256 hues, hues of colour. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, you know, 256, now we've got like, you know, millions or to a billion colours that we have that as like a part of our display technology. Uh, it says, like the popular Defender, Space Odyssey lets arcade as poly Oh, Space Odyssey, well, that's an interesting one. I have to play Space and Odyssey, I have to play that on MAME at some point. It says it's like a Defender-like game. Venture um, by Exidy. Actually, I haven't really played that much either. Call Cabinet. A upright Warlords. We can't really play. I mean, you can play Warlords up like right, guys, you know, with two players, but it's a four-player game. You can put four controllers on that. So, really, you want to enjoy four. Lords of Karma. Right, so this goes... This That was just the coin-op stuff. Now we're back into... Computer Playland, so this is an Atari 800 and Pet Tower, I said 80 game, it's Horse Racing, Gorgon, Space, Space Trader, hmm, now that was on the Trash 80, on the Terrace 80, I'm pretty sure my friend had that game, because I then got a game that was sort of similar called Galactic Trader on the Atari 400 and 800, I wonder how many of you guys know that particular game. And it was one of those ones you go across the universe, you know, and you buy certain goods and you sell it in other areas of the universe. And, of course, that sounds all very grand and massive. And in today's world, you have awesome graphics doing that. And they've got games like that now, of course, um, taking that same theme. But it was very, very basic graphics. But cool, cool, fun playing. Now we get into those little standalone console things. Dark Tower Challenges, Challenges Adventurers. Dark Tower, a fantasy adventure born of electronic wizardry. I never, I never saw that back in the day. Bank shot for electronic pull. Tell you what, that Dark Tower looks pretty cool. First computerized fantasy board game. So mixing again the electronics and the original board games. Then we got Alien Attack. 
check out this 10 pin <laughs> game oh my goodness so many little uh, handhelds wildfire own your own arcade game it says once upon a time the ultimate dream of all arcade fanatics was to own a real live pinball machine the well healed bought old even badly damaged flipper games and had them cleaned up and even rebuilt often at great expense but possessing one meant more than just a chic luxury or or hip status symbol the mere presence of such a wonderful collection of flashing colored lights and electronic beeps and boops seemed to create its own portable arcade atmosphere of fun and excitement in one's own home <laughs> welcome to the theater of magic <laughs> because that's exactly what we've recreated here and again if you haven't come from this that early era guys hopefully that text right there in the magazine captures the very essence of why you know people my age and and younger and older um, collect video games you know it, it's that it's exactly that you know that was what i thought back then that's what i still think now in relation to them and it seems so strange because they're just you know <laughs> these big boxes of wood with some basic electronics and most people look at it and just don't understand but that that is why it goes on i think it's important to talk about this is such a good article moreover some of the better flippers were authentic works of pop art and that's true again the whole artistic side of it even the most conventional roadhouse quality machine made an ideal conversion piece and of course you could even play pinball on them this however is all in the past just as the video game has dethroned pinball as the arcade king today's arcade dreams of the day when he he will first plug in his very own pac-man asteroids or phoenix <laughs> ah <laughs> takes me back most popular type of coin op video game among private collectors is still the cocktail or table model and yeah and again you know those are the ones that i that that was what i played back in those restaurants those were the ones that seemed more accessible and would be really really cool in your house and i had that just that dream of having that space invaders and the, of, you know i've got that cocktail machine now i so want to get that back get that original Space Invaders board in there and relive that experience, guys. And that will be my, my cocktail machine that I dreamt about all those years ago from reading articles like this. It says, of course, no coin-op game is cheap. <laughs> the newer, still popular games cost anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 new. And that would be US dollars. And again, back then, multiplying it out, you know, you're probably looking around about $9,000 for a game, you know, equivalent of today's money. Um, it was expensive. In the US, the upright model is still the standard, but as coin op units spread to convenience stores and movie theater lobbies, a new size game cabinet called the Cabaret. <laughs> so it's introducing the first concept of a Cabaret has made the scene. And the Cabaret is a stand up game but it's smaller and more streamlined so there you go so we took back cocktail machines and cabarets wow it says the few that are sold go mostly to specialized markets such as resorts and small private clubs and restaurants <laughs> it doesn't say that but that's where they went to where the novelty of any video game old or new will stimulate interest it is at this level that the private collector can pick up the video game of his dreams and then we have a look at a couple of these games here Again, these, these are ones that we really need to get onto Mave at some, some point, guys, and just sort of relive what was available around at the time, you know, just thinking about those early games. Got a Starhawk, Boot Hill, Targ, Night Driver, Football, uh, Video Pinball. That's that's beautiful. We've talked about Video Pinball before, Battle Zone. And we've got prices on here too. How cool is that? So that boot hill from Midway was actually pretty cheap, or three three ninety five again could have been like a, about a thousand bucks maybe. Um, the Night Driver, I remember playing that, and uh, you know, Tari four hundred bucks. Video Pinball was six ninety five. Battle Zone though two thousand dollars. Wow, and then the Classic Breakout as well. Then some um, Lunar Lander on the 400 800 scott adams and scott adams was super popular with all his adventure series got to cover that another time um but uh luna lander what an awesome game that was wildfire didn't end up playing that super breakout was an extension of the original breakout i remember playing that 
and we're over to the electronic games hotline continue from 16 so there was some more support type of, of course you didn't have like support like you didn't have google <laughs> you know, to look up stuff on the internet you had to ask questions you had to write your questions into the magazines guys and wait for them to publish it and then release the following month and pick it up and get your answer <laughs> that's how that's how you used to do it to get information from elsewhere some more cool art some football art and here we go into touch and of course i'm not i've not been a big american football i grew up in new zealand moved to australia but of course american football wasn't really um featured anywhere uh in new zealand at the time so i really didn't get the get, get the sport very well but there is one arcade version and i can't remember what it's called right off the top of my head but um when i see it one day i'll let you know guys because there was one that we actually did used to play and we, just because it was a fun game and a very very basic one but yeah it was really really fun few more handhelds here um just so many of these handhelds i wonder how many of those hit the trash chess robots gosh there's all these chess computers oh my goodness just a ton of those and then we had a reader poll <laughs> this was the you know like this the uh feedback and you had to uh fill it in and and uh, send it back. Feel free to photocopy this page. <laughs> back in the days of photocopiers. Ah, and I remember my dad's photocopy that he had at his work. We used to go through and photocopy all sorts of stuff. I remember the smell of the toner on that thing. But I used to think it was so cool to be able to just like photocopy things. And I do remember <laughs> you know, being what, 10 or 11 or something, photocopying some $5 notes and you know, not using them. Of course, it was like black and white, no color, of course. And, uh, but I remember cutting them all out and just creating all my own money stacks. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't take that route in terms of uh, later on in life. And we have a little ad saying for the next one on sale, January 14, 1982, is the next version of Electronic Games. This would be the next one of these guys that we will cover off in a future episode when we come back to this style of uh, video and it talks about the history of video games it talks about the 1982 Arc arcade awards the hall of fame how video games are made just such a great great video um video <laughs> video, video game magazine uh, really really was and then we finish up on these final pages here arcading on the big apple in new york and um oh check that out what is that space tactics it says on there and of course i think they've this is a sega machine and they've extended it out on the photo surely they have um how cool is that it's a space fury wizard of war defender so some cool insight to some of the arcade stuff broadway arcade amusement center and it's so sad that a lot of these arcade um venues are no longer available space odyssey and then finishing up on the last page we are on activision's kaboom that very very popular game from activision and there you go guys so um again you know just just really stop and think about that in terms of that was the catalog of information that's all you had you couldn't go search for more and you know lying back and I, I do seriously do vividly remember being just so absorbed into this information and just being so you know my my imagination just being fired up thinking about these games and the and the new stuff coming out in the arcades and and when i possibly see it you know and you go out um to your local shops and you just be amazed when the next arcade machine turned up and and that was you know that 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 was the reality um you know just that one game turning up on that one day not like today you know hop on with an ipad and scroll through hundreds of thousands of apps you know we just we have just a glut of entertainment available to us today and it's just not the same you know so and i'm not saying today's bad by any means <laughs> hopefully i'm not getting so old and uh decrepit that oh, back in my day <laughs> you know, it's not like that at all guys but 
um, I do hope that this this sort of thing going through this occasionally, going through some of these magazines, and we'll do, you know we'll do it occasionally. I'm hoping that it just gives you a bit of insight into what makes you know collecting games like this so special for a lot of people that do it, and, and you know if you know someone that, that does it and you're not sure sure why, <laughs> or maybe you're not sure why some people get so fanatical about it. Um, it's because yeah, it's it's reliving childhood memories, um, very special memories. So, so uh, I think I'll leave it there. It's probably been a pretty long video getting through that, um, but I hope you've joined me on the way through. And thanks if you have. And uh, if you liked the video, then please give it a like. And of course, if you want to follow me doing all sorts of other stuff in here, <laughs> not always talking. Um, playing some games and fixing up things and bits and pieces then please do subscribe and join the journey along with everyone else and um, I really look forward to doing some more videos for you again every week every Friday keeping to the commitment even though it's getting really busy <laughs> and uh, until next time guys make sure you uh, look after yourselves play your games fix your games all that good stuff remember to subscribe and until uh, next time ciao for now you must continue you can do it you are amazing the theater is now closed <laughs>